Hey, hey, all right, welcome back. Chapter two, number one. Um, yeah, mostly, I mean, this is going to be a sort of a bit of a motivational lecture, I guess, or let me just jump right into it. So we're going to be here. Um, so we're going to, I titled this Seeking Truth, How Psychology Differs from Philosophy. Um, and, and I should have said, and why this is such an important chapter for all of you. Um, let me jump into it this uh, at this place. There, there's a real, this is a, a psychological phenomenon. It's a really powerful one that causes a lot of trouble in the world. It's something called confirmation bias. And it's this notion that once we sort of believe something, or once we come to a certain opinion or belief about something, it seems our brain really wants to hold on to that belief. So that when we're exposed to data, like this would be all this data that's out there, we really like the data that fits with our beliefs, and we completely ignore the data that doesn't. Um, or we'll downplay it, or we'll make it sound unimportant, but the data that fits our belief we, we think is really important and confirms us. So we have this bias to always kind of confirm what we believe to be true. Now, that would be great if we were right about everything, uh, but we're not. You know, very often our beliefs are inaccurate, and we would like to think that we are good at refining our beliefs at, at based on evidence, that when evidence comes that defies what we believe, that we change what we believe. But we're very resistant to do that. Um, and, and so that becomes very important when we think about the issue of, well, how do we get to the truth of something? If we have a bunch of people resistant to changing their beliefs, how can we ever get to the truth of things? Okay, um, so let's just have an example here. And I've got the URLs in case you guys are interested in these stories, but you guys get exposed to science all the time. Um, so here, drink up daily coffee tied to longer, healthier life. This is pretty recent, by the way. This is March 2022. Coffee's making a comeback on the research side. Um, here's another one. It doesn't even seem to matter whether the coffee has caffeine or not. Now, this is sort of an interesting an interesting sort of, um, I don't know, follow-up, because I think for all of us, if we saw that first study, we would just assume it's the caffeine, right? I mean, coffee has, as, as suggested here, coffee has all sorts of um, things in it, but if we hear that people who drink more coffee live longer, we assume naturally it's the caffeine, and, you know, that might be a belief we just grab, but, but this uh, next study says, you know what, it works for decaffeinated too, that's a good example of how we can change our beliefs, right? When we have a good scientific study that says, oh, so it's not the caffeine. Oh, it's, it's other stuff. Um, but the bigger point I want to make to you guys right now is you guys are bombarded by stuff like this every day. And the journalists do not give you the full details of the studies they're talking about. Often it's not even clear if it's an experimental study or a correlational study. You'll, you'll find out about the difference of those as we go on and why you should trust experimental studies much more than correlational studies. Um, but often you don't know. And so the question is, you know, how are we going to have a, a citizenry that is what we're going to call scientifically literate? Right? How are we going to have a group of people who can actually understand what they're seeing and, and think about it in the way a scientist would think about it so that they really understand what something is saying but also what it's not saying? Right? And so we call this scientific literacy. Um, scientific, to be concerned with or pertaining to science or the sciences. Literacy, the ability to read for knowledge. And so can you read science? and understand. So the ability to read for and gain knowledge that pertains to science. There's a lot of people who think they're scientifically literate uh, in this day and age. There's a lot of people who, you know, say, hey, I've gone to the internet, I've done my research. They like to use that word research, which means they've read a bunch of biased articles usually, um, and I know what I believe to be true. I don't need the scientific community to tell me what's true. Okay, that's that's a worry um, because of confirmation bias, first of all. You know, they're only looking for the stuff that fits with what they believe anyway. And do they really, if they're so willing to um, dispel science or, or, you know, relegate it to like, yeah, whatever, my research is just as good as a scientist, then they don't really understand science. They, they really don't. And if any of you 
believe that way. If any of you guys are the people who believe, yes, I've done my own research, I hope by the end of this chapter you'll get a different sense um, and that you'll start to understand why scientifically published papers, peer-reviewed papers, are much, much more trustworthy, even and maybe especially when they go against what you believe to be true. And those are the papers you should be seeking out. And if you're scientifically literate, you can read those papers and figure out, yeah, does it seem like it was, like, should I be changing my mind? Or is there reason not to? But the idea is that you're literate enough to, to really go and, and, and figure it out, okay? So, yeah, it turns out, you know, the, the, this notion of being scientifically literate is probably more important than it's ever been, and I've already alluded to this, but, but a lot of people say we live in this post-truth world. Wow, this looks so big now that I see it on my screen, um, which is relating or denoting the circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. There is a whole lot of this going on, um, you know, especially, say, in the anti-vaxxer kind of circles where there's all this fear mongering about what a vaccine might do, you know, despite the fact that the whole world is at it almost and there's very little negative impact. But there's a lot of, you know, fear mongering around that and connections to beliefs like freedom. Don't you believe in freedom, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so in this era of post-truth politics, it's really easy for people to kind of cherry pick the stuff they want, um, that confirmation bias, and to use that to support an emotional argument that, that already fits with what they believe. Um, and so we seem to be living in this sort of post-truth age. And, and because of that, it's more important than ever that people become scientifically literate. As many as we can, we need more human beings to understand the benefits of science and to be able to connect with it at a deep level. And that's one of the things we hope to teach you in this course. We hope to give you experience doing exactly that. Okay. So let's kind of get into this because in a way the post-truth world isn't anything new. Well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, the, definitely the appeals to emotion and, and personal belief are true, but this idea of, you know, just people arguing and trying to get at the truth um, by, well, rational argument. So this is where we're going to split philosophy off from like the anti-vaxxers, okay? So the anti-vaxxers, it's about emotional argument for the most part, but philosophy. I want to talk about how philosophy and, and psychology are different. And, you know, philosophy has been around for ever, <laughs> you know, for a long time. Since humans have been around, they've been curious about the world and how things work, and they've come up with ideas. Um, and often the typical way of of sort of figuring out what's true from all these ideas was what we call the rationalist approach. This is what most philosophers use. Uh, the belief that human beings can arrive at the truth by using reason rather than by relying on the authority of the past, on religious faith or intuition. Um, so this was the world, you know, that, that many philosophers lived in, where religion was really powerful, um, and they were being told this is true. And, and some of these rationalists are saying, hey, hang on, we can, we can think things through um, and kind of come to what makes sense as truth or not. Uh, and so philosophers often created very complex arguments. Um, they had thought experiments. Uh, they would um, argue with one another and try to disprove each other's sense of reality. But really the tricky thing is, it's just a bunch of people arguing for what they believe to be true. And how do you ever know who is right? Um, can you really get to truth or at least any important truth other than maybe, you know, I think therefore I am, um, okay. But what if we want to really understand this, you know, us, for example, deeply, can we just rely on philosophical theories about how say human memory works or do we need to take another step? And when psychology was really born in the late 1800s, there was that notion that we need to take another step. Okay, so if we think about the scientific process, um, a lot of philosophy can really just fit in, into here. You know, philosophers were looking around, they were looking internally, sometimes introspecting, and then they were just coming up with a theory. And that was it. Then it stopped. Whereas in classic science, it doesn't stop. 
we, we go from that theory to a hypothesis, a prediction that that theory makes, and then we test that prediction with an experiment. This is called empiricism. It's saying it's not enough to, to believe something is true. You have to go show it in the real world. You have to go show that if your, if your theory is right, it can predict how things will behave in the real world. And so we want to do that experiment, analyze the data, report the conclusions, and then maybe change our views and shape our theory over time. And it's the data and experiments that are helping us progress. So it all comes down to this question. And by the way, you know, when we say what makes something a science, it's this. It's the adoption of the scientific method and especially experiments, which will be the sort of culmination of this chapter. At the end, we'll talk a lot more about experiments. They are what really makes um, science science because it's through the experiments that we avoid the um, confirmation bias, right? We go in there thinking we know what's going to happen, but then the data tells us, and very often the data tells us we are wrong and the data wins, Okay, and so that's why science is really important because we're constantly verifying our beliefs with experiments and data collection. Um, and so overall, in a general sense, these are some of the things I hope you're going to get as we go through this chapter. That what makes science powerful? First of all, there are very clear standards for how to conduct and report a meaningful experiment. Okay? You can't just do a sloppy little experiment that confirms what you believe. You have to design the experiment properly to avoid any sort of problems with your interpretations. And so a lot of um, what we're going to talk about is what we're going to call experimental design. We won't do that that much in this chapter, but it is an important topic that you'll follow up in the second year. Uh, you know, how to design a really great experiment. Um, also, we use proper statistical analyses to help decide which results are reliable and which are not. So it's not just a question of we do experiment and go, oh yeah, that worked. No, no, no. Did it work? Well, we actually use stats in a very principled way to let us know what the data is saying to us. It's not up to us to just interpret numbers. Um, we put them through this formal structured process that we've all agreed on is the correct one. And that's how we ultimately find out what our data is saying. Even when somebody reports something, um, we then don't necessarily trust it. We use replication. We hope other people will do the experiment in other places, maybe using a slightly different approach, but that they'll get at the same bit of truth, you know, the same hypothesis, and they'll test it in a different way. And if they find they can support that hypothesis as well, then we use that replication to start to say, okay, this truth is a trustworthy truth. And even then, we don't really think, we never think of it as a truth in science. We just think of it as the most supported current theory. Right. Um, so we never embrace it like, aha, we found the answer. Uh, well, we found an answer that seems to be holding up pretty well. Um, there's also a really important element here that's so often forgotten. And this is the cooperative interaction of the community of experts to ensure published work is strong. When I submit my when I've got a scientific paper and I want it published, I want to share it with the world. I first have to convince three other people like me three other scientists like me, that my work f really is, you know, up to the standards of good research, that it is scholarly, that I haven't been biased in, in the work that I'm discussing, that I'm, that I'm talking about the whole literature that's out there, um, and that I'm using the proper statistical analyses, and that my conclusions flow from my research. Um, they are the gateway that prevents crap from getting out there. They are sometimes a fallible gateway, um, but but f at least there's a gateway, right? As opposed to, for example, social media, where anybody can post anything anytime they want, and none of it is vetted. Whereas here we have three experts vetting very carefully. It's really hard to go through this peer review process. And therefore, those published papers, you can trust them in a way you cannot trust something that just pops up on your social media feed. I really hope you have a great understanding of that by the time we're done uh, this chapter. Okay, and so now just a basic word here. I want to connect this to the issue of, hey, some of you guys are already thinking, I'd love to be in a research lab. I'd love to be doing research. And in fact, we have some courses 
that allow you to do research with a faculty member at UTSC. And people often say, well, how do I, how do I get into these courses? Well, the first trick is to get a faculty member to agree to supervise you. Okay, how do I do that? Um, and, and often, you know, first year students are really keen and they want to do that. And I have to tell them what, you know what, we usually want you to do some of these courses first, maybe not the advanced ones, but, but some of these courses we would like you to take in your second year. These are not juicy psychology courses about, you know, development or clinical psychology. These are more the, the tools of the trade. These are the skills that you need to learn. You need to learn how to analyze data. You need to learn how to um, create a proper experiment, experimental design. In fact, I should have had B10 in here too, which is experimental design. How to report scientific results appropriately. Um, we love it when students have taken these courses and have a decent GPA, and then they come ask if they could do research in our lab. And we can say, oh, okay, well, you already seem to have all the core skills in place. You've learned the core skills of research. So yeah, now let's bring you in and let's, let's jump into some fun um, psychological research. So realize that if you're trying to get into research before you've done some of these, it's going to be difficult. Um, we really like to see that you have those skills in place. And that's why they happen earlier in the curriculum. Um, and then these ones are a little later. Okay. Um, yeah, so we typically do not agree to supervise student research projects until they've done at least some of these courses with a fairly good CGPA. We want to know that you could potentially go on to be a researcher too. So we want to see that. Okay, so just a word on that to get you thinking about that, seeing how this all links up in the curriculum. Okay, so I'm um, going to leave it there uh, for now, but um, fantastic. Uh, I will see you in Chapter 2, but hopefully this lecture got you kind of thinking, hey, this might not be the most exciting chapter about the scientific method, but it's a really important one in terms of your ability to consume science and really understand um, and, and, and therefore... I don't know, um, harness it in the best way for yourself. Okay, leave it there. Bye-bye.